King James Bible as the fuller reading. Uh, the NIV Bible omits 5,219 words from the text. The New Century Version, which local churches out here are uh, recommending, um, omits 11,114 words from the text. What is sin? I'd say that's sin. Amen? Amen. Yeah, what's the Bible say about taking away from... Oh, never mind that, right? So the King James Bible, amen, like we've just seen in only three examples of hundreds, is the King James Bible elevates Jesus Christ to where it needs to be, above everybody. He is sinless, amen? Well, let's talk about six testimonies of Jesus Christ's sinlessness. You've kind of put it like a court situation. You know, you, you bring up Jesus himself. What do you say about yourself, amen? Go to John 8, John chapter 8. Jesus is on the stand, and the prosecutor comes up, looks at him, and says, what do you have to say for yourself? You know, we got this group of people that are saying you're sinless. What do you say about your own self, Jesus? John 8, 46. The Bible says, Jesus' words here, which of you convinced me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? You think about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the stand. You say, what do you say? You say you're sinless, Jesus? He says, which of you convinced me of sin? Now, when, when he said that, you've got to understand, these people didn't just know him for a day. These people grew up in the same town as him. You know, uh, some disciples who knew him for years were hanging out right right then and there. I mean, this wasn't just some fly-by-night guy. These are people who have had time to watch him for a little while. And man, I mean, if, if you've worked a job for more than a year, you think you could say that to your boss? Which of you convinced me of sin? They'd be like, well, do you have some time? <laughs> you know, I mean... I've compiled a list here, actually, off the top of my head. You wicked sinner. Amen. So Jesus himself, he claimed to be sinless. And no matter what the college professor says. Now, we understand with Jesus Christ, he historically existed. If you, if you can't at least get that much, you got big problems. He existed historically. You can walk where he walked. You can go to the places where he went. And uh, Sister Hope, she's been there, we've been there, and we've seen these places. I mean, they all got Catholic churches built, up, built over them now, so I mean, I guess we're not really wanting to go in, but, yeah, but anyway, Jesus himself, he claimed to be sinless. What are you going to do with that? Does that change anything in your life? Well, Jesus had a judge, didn't he? When he was here on earth. It was Pontius Pilate. Turn over to John chapter 18. We're talking about the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. We're in John chapter 18 and verse 38. Short conversation Pilate has with Jesus Christ. Art thou a king then, he says? Jesus says, Thou sayest I'm a king. To this end I was born. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? Could you imagine saying that to Jesus Christ? Mm. You little smart out of you. Wash your mouth out with soap. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. You think Pilate was an idiot? You think he got to that position because he was stupid? You don't think he was a good judge of character, maybe? You realize his job was probably laying on the line with the decision he was about to make with this man? And I mean, we're going to see in a moment here, he had a wife, so if he had a wife, Probably pretty likely he might have had some kids. This job's feeding his kids. You, th you think he's just going just gonna to shoo this decision off? I find in him no fault at all. Pontius Pilate said it. Mrs. Pontius Pilate said it. We go to Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27. 
And in Matthew 27 and verse 19, now Mrs. Pontius Pilate could really care less about Jesus Christ, okay? He didn't affect her, her one way or another. But something happened. And she had a dream. And stuff started happening and she made a judgment. Mrs. Pontius Pilate, there in Matthew 27 and verse 19. It says, When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. You don't think she had the newspaper uh, tabloids going around? You don't think she knew what was going on in their town? Of course she did. She knew exactly who Jesus Christ was. She, she knew that there was going to be a big decision to make with this man. She said, have thou nothing to do with that just man. It gets worse. We'll go to Luke 23. Hang it right. Go to Luke chapter 23. And we look at verse 41. Luke 23 and verse 41. These are just six testimonies of Christ's sinlessness. One of them was his, and I'm going to give you five others. There's... Uh, I believe there's seven total, but I'm only giving you a few. And uh, so in Luke 23 and verse 41, we meet a dying man named the thief on the cross, right? You remember it? Jesus Christ, he died like a thief. And uh, even though he was without sin, he died as a sinner. We're in Luke 23 and verse 41, and it says, uh, and we, indeed, justly, he's talking about why they're dying on, on the cross. We, indeed, justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. He's like, man, we earned this. That's why we're here. But he says, but this man had done nothing to miss. So this is ultimately a man's dying words. Why would he waste it on saying that if it wasn't true? The thief on the cross. Well... Look over in Matthew 27 and verse 4. In the left, Matthew 27 and verse 4. We meet the man that sold out Jesus Christ. Oh, surely he's got some goodies for us, right? He walked with him for three and a half years. You know, uh, he knows his sin. If somebody walked with you for three and a half years, they'd probably know yours too, right? Or five minutes. You know, I mean, if it was me, it wouldn't take very long. Matthew 27 and verse 4. And it says here, Now this one he was returning the money that he sold out Jesus for. He's saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See, thou do that. They didn't want the money back. What's done was done. Amen? That's how life is sometimes. You make a decision. It's not always repaired by saying, I'm sorry. You, 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 uh, you, something comes out of your mouth, you can't ever get those words back. Amen. You said it. You know, and uh, you've got to be really careful what you say. But Judas Iscariot, the very man that sold him out, 30 pieces of silver, said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. And we, we know actually what happened to Judas. He died not there long after. So these are really kind of his last words too. What did he have to lose at this point? He lost everything. He didn't have nothing else he can lose. Well, then uh, lastly, we look at Jesus' executioner. Go over to Luke 23. Hang it right. Luke 23. And we're going to look at verse 47. Was Jesus Christ sinless? I think you're probably convinced by now, amen? You're probably just convinced because He saved your soul. Mm -hmm. That was enough for me. Amen. But some people, they need a little more. Amen? You know, we need to be like the Bereans. We need to make sure these things are so. Luke 23 and verse 47 says in Luke 23, 47, Now when the centurion, his executioner, saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. Wow. That's really amazing. The guy that took him out. 
said, this man is a righteous man, certainly. Well, we looked at what is sin. We looked at the King James Bible, proclaiming he's sinless. The six testimonies. Now I want to look at just a couple arguments against the, G the uh, sinlessness of Jesus Christ. See, God works in the realm of impossible. And I think we could just say that. I mean, you, you're born again. Look at you. Wasn't that pretty impossible? Yeah. I mean, you ask some of your family members, some of your old neighbors, you know, uh, if there was anyone to get saved, do you think they'd say you? You know, my, my old youth pastor, when I got born again Amen. when I was 17, uh, I wanted to introduce him to my wife some years ago, and they said, Randy, out of all the kids in that class, you were the last one mm -hmm. that we really thought God would ever do anything with. Amen. But they prayed for me, Praise amen, and, and he tried to preach it as straight as he knew it, and, and it got me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Praise the Lord. But God works in the realm of impossible. See, Elijah outnumbered by 400 prophets of Baal. Those odds seem pretty impossible. And we know the outcome of it. He called down fire. He slayed all of them. And uh, then with little young David and a great experienced giant named Goliath, those odds are pretty impossible. And God showed up. Amen. God works in the realm of impossible. When you got a, a bunch of uh, bickering uh, children of Israel and you're sitting there at the shore scratching your head like, I thought we were supposed to go this way, Lord. There's a bunch of water here in our way. And, I mean, we don't have a boat. You know, uh, you gave Noah a boat, man. I mean, where's my boat? You know, and but yet with Moses, he opened up that Red Sea. And they walked across on dry land. If, I mean, if just opening up the sea wasn't enough, right? They didn't even have to walk in mud. That's really something. Uh, you look at uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, even the guys throwing them in the flames got burned up. And they come out, and they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. When, it, when we broke the news to Mary Chris's brother that she's pregnant, this guy was smoking a cigarette probably about 10 feet away. He said, hey. And the guy says, yeah. He says, uh, you need to walk a little bit further that way. You know? <laughs> and the guy got kind of, and he walked away. But he's like, I don't want that baby inhaling that smoke. But you, you hang around someone that's smoking cigarettes, you'll start to smell like it. It doesn't take very much. They came out of that of that furnace without even the smell of smoke. That's my God. I don't know about yours, amen, but that's mine. That's how my God does things. And that's His realm. He works in the realm of impossible. And it, See, the first argument with the sinlessness of Jesus Christ is that's impossible. Right? That's what they say. Well, Jesus' birth seemed impossible too. Got that one worked out. Jesus' teaching at a young age, about 12, in a synagogue seemed kind of impossible too. You know, you have these doctors checking him out, people that earn their PhD, and they're like, you, nobody even taught you how to read. How are you opening up this Torah to us and showing us these things? That's impossible. Jesus healing all the lame and blind people seemed impossible too. I like his style. He'd choose to do it on the Sabbath, too. <laughs> Just to ruffle your feathers, you know? And uh, Jesus walking on the water seemed impossible. Jesus' resurrection seemed pretty impossible. Jesus, you think he'd have a problem being sinless if he could do all that? I think his resurrection proves he's sinless. Proves that he's God in the flesh. We've been working through all that these weeks. But since Jesus was tempted, would be their, their other argument, since he was tempted, which you know he was, by the devil, he must have been a sinner because he got tempted. Right? I'm going to teach you something today. You might already know, maybe you don't. But the question becomes, if and when an individual gets tempted, does that determine that they have sinned? At that point that the temptation comes, have they sinned? I'm going to talk to you about something real quick called the doctrine of peccability. This is the process of sin. You'll learn something today, maybe. 
for free. <laughs> well, when sin comes, there's first a presentation. 